All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining Jenkins Online Meetup. Our session for today is on Jenkins and Google Summer of Code. We are focusing on project midterm status and demos. My name is Alyssa Tong. I'm one of the org admins for Jenkins in GSOC 2024. Along on this webinar with me are other org admins, Chris Stern and Bruno Varakton. Chris and Bruno are also project mentors. We also have uh, two other mentors on uh, here as well, Valentin, De Valentin Delane and um, Alexander Brandis. On to the next slide. So the Jenkins Online Meetup is a community-driven virtual platform. Our goal is to inform, transfer knowledge, and share all things Jenkins. We are always looking for speakers. So if you have a compelling Jenkins story to share with the community, please reach out to us via that last link. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded. We will share the link on the Meetup page after the event. If you have questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A window throughout the presentation. Our presenters and mentors are helping to respond to them. And if there are questions that we didn't get to uh, because we are out of time, uh, please feel free to hop on over to Gitter or Discourse channels. We'll respond after the event. And per the usual, the Jenkins Code of Conduct is fully enforced here as well as throughout our community. If you're not sure what that is, it means um, being kind and respectful to one another. So on the agenda, uh, we will quickly cover what is Google's Summer of Code, and then we'll go right into our project presentations. One of our contributors isn't available to deliver his presentation live, so we will be playing the recording for his session. So what is Google Summer of Code? Google Summer of Code is a global online program focused on bringing new contributors into open source software development. GSOC contributors work with open source organizations. In this case, it's Jenkins. And they work on it for about 12 plus weeks of programming project under the guidance of mentors. The three main ingredients uh, of this program includes project idea, GSOC contributor, and mentors. The project idea is what problem are we trying to solve? The GSOC contributor is the mentee, the conduit for the project idea. And then there's the mentors. They are known as the silent architects, the unsung heroes who are shaping the future of Jenkins. Our mentors are unpaid volunteers. Like most of us, they hold a full-time job and or go to school in addition to being a GSOC mentor. So we are very grateful to have our mentors. This is Jenkins' eighth year in as a mentoring org um, in Google Summer of Code, and we have uh, Google to thank for that. We are currently working on five project ideas this year, and those five projects are being worked on by Noor Almuhem, Shlomo Dahan, Philip Glantz, Sridhar Siva Kumar, and Dan Yang Zhao. So without further ado, we will go into, um, let me see, I need to stop sharing here, go into Shlomo's recording to start our, pre our uh, project presentations. So let me unplug my headset. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Shlomo. I am working on the implementing UI for Jenkins Infra Statistics project this summer. Um, my mentors on this project are Chris, Vendi, Terbet, and Bruno, and they've been really great this summer, providing good feedback and direction on the project. 
a little bit about myself. I am <clears throat> currently a master's student at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, before working in tech, I actually worked in finance and it's been a really exciting transition. I'm really passionate about exploring new technologies and just continuously learning in this field. And this is actually my first experience with open source. So it's really exciting to be part of this community and just to see how excited everyone is about contributing to the software. Um, a little bit about this project that I'm working on. Basically, it's meant to revamp the current Jenkins Infostat site, which at this point is not very uh, useful to those that need the data. The, the way the site is laid out and the way the data is displayed is just really hard to navigate, really hard to make sense out of, out of the data that's being displayed. So we just want to enhance the user experience by providing a more intuitive, um, appealing interface, um, improving accessibility, and facilitating better decision making for those that actually need data. Um, also, uh, the, the site is going to match what the other Jenkins sites actually look like. So we're just kind of taking all that styling inspiration from the current Jenkins components and sites and, and using it for this site. Um, how we're going to be building this is with React for the front end with the Vite framework, Apache e charts for all the data visualization and charting and material UI for consistent styled components. So I'll just get right into the demo. Let me share my screen. I just want to start by showing the current Jenkins interest that site <clears throat> and showing you what it currently looks like and why it needs to be improved. So this is the site. If we get into the, the data straight away, you can see when you're opening the stats and detail page that you have these very large SVG images here that are not really readable. If you open them, you can see that it's, it's impossible to see the labeling and anything like that. So this, this is kind of useless data here. Um, similarly, with the statistics by months, if you go through it, you can download the, S the CSV files to get that, that raw data. But if you wanted to look at the SVG and see what that data looks like, you see these charts that are not really readable. Um, some of the labeling on the smaller charts is okay, like this one, for example. But if you get into the later months when there's way more data, you, you can't really see what's going on, for example, this chart. So this is just the first page. For the second page, um, plugin installation trend, you have a list of plugins. Um, and you when you click into it, you just see a JSON file with some data here. And Unless you're going to be pulling this data and doing your own visualization, this is not really helpful to the user. Um, so I'll show you what, and, and also for the last page, um, similarly, you have a chart that pops up, but it's not really styled in a way that, that matches anything on the site. So getting into my, my updates. So this is what the landing page looks like. You can see already that it matches more of the Jenkins style. And if we get into the pages straight away, the statistics and detail page was designed to be kind of like a dashboard. So you have these large charts that pop up. You can see month by month um, numbers on the tooltip, and you can zoom in and out. You can download the SVG, the CSV directly, and you have all the relevant data here, total jobs, Jenkins installations, nodes, JVMs. Um, if you get into the monthly analysis tab, you can filter it by year, or you can view all the data. But if you do go to all data and you go to any of the data points here, when you click on an item, it will just pop up a modal with that graph. And it has similar functionality to the previous one where you can zoom in, download the SVG, the CSV. And this makes it just really nice to use, really intuitive. Um, everything stays on the page. It's all styled to match. And, and it's, it makes the data actually useful because you can actually get into it, see exactly what's going on here. Um, so that's the stats and detail page. Um, going over to the plugin installation trend, the idea here was to create um, a bunch of cards which, which show a, a trend line of, of the number of installations. So you can kind of get an idea straight off the bat before even clicking into the plugin. Like if this is something that's, growing or if this is something that's being phased out or discontinued. Um, when you do click on a particular card, you a, a dashboard pops up here. And on this dashboard, you can see the monthly installations, percentage, 
um, relative to the Jenkins installations, the monthly installations, the installations by version, and installations by version percent as a pie chart, which helps identify which is the version in the as of the most previous month that's being downloaded the most. Um, similarly, with any other plugin, you can see this stuff. And if you if you want to, you can sort it by installations high to low, installations low to high. You can search for a particular plugin. And so this makes it really cool and really useful for those that need the data. Uh, moving on to the next page, you have the plugin versions by Jenkins version. This page is um, a bit more simple because of the way that the table is currently laid out. But if you um, select the plugin, <clears throat> you have a chart that pops up. You can hover over the table and see a few more details about what these numbers mean. And if you have a larger chart like this plugin, for example, you'll be able to scroll and pan through the entire table. And this, this design matches um, the rest of the site and stays consistent with the entire Jenkins ecosystem. Um, so that's the demo of the site. I'm sorry to rush through it. I know we're short on time, so um, I just wanted to leave some extra time. If anyone had some questions for the mentors, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I hope this, this demo does it justice. All right, so we will uh, take questions now. Are there any questions? I can't see any question, uh, whether in the chat or even in the Q&A, so no question for the time being. Um, Vendit is an attendee, uh, by the way, so maybe we could promote him sure. uh, right away. Doing it right now. Thanks a lot. Yep, done. So, um, yeah, I guess no question. We could maybe okay. switch to the next one. Yeah, so that will be Philip, and then I'll let you start sharing, Philip. Perfect. Thanks. Um, welcome to improve the maintainability of the repository permission updater. I am Philip. Um, I am working as a software engineer at a German software pro uh, service provider in Munich. And my first touch was already like 10 years ago, just like a kid with playing some Minecraft and Jenkins was my choose as a first open source software to automate my programming stuff. And now it's the time to giving something back. That's why I'm here. Um, if you interested what I'm doing also more, you can check out my GitHub. Um, now about the APU. The YAPU is something that synchronizes permissions from a GitHub repository inside of the APU in a folder via YAML files into our GitHub and Artifactory. And inside of that, um, we need that because maintainability of manually managed permissions of thousands of plugins and contributors will take so many time. How is that um, currently co um, managed? Uh, the APU takes the YAML file, converted it uh, into um, JSON and other formats, and calling some REST APIs with own implementation over query or other stuff to apply the changes to Artifactory and uh, GitHub. Also, he checks the account is accessed on Jira. That's also an important step, but um, that's currently just what doing the RPU and why we need that. Now about my project and the background on my challenges. The RPU is currently already over nine years old and he has written with old GUI scripts. That means we cannot use new Java features from Java 21. And also there is no unit test. That means this code is not really stable. If something get changed, uh, we cannot predict if something get broke. That's currently one of many problems of them. 
And now it's come my part. Um, my part is like, um, we can resolve this problem. Um, I decided to, in this GZorg, to convert all the query script to Java code, um, abstract the code in some design patterns like facades or builder pattern, um, writing some journal tests for new contributors or maintainers in the future to uh, let the code stable and also implement new Java features like records or something um, to reduce uh, poacher objects and other stuff. Now, um, the current status of the UPU already three PS got merged or two. Um, the Groovy scripts are so far migrated already. Um, unit tests also are already so far written, but uh, one heavy PS currently open and the most important thing is every pair with what I am open uh, don't break currently um, functionality because it's using in production. And how can I look that in the future now? Because when we have already converted everything into Groovy and Java, we can also reorganize the packages with a um, better concept because currently everything is thrown in some weird namings and encapsulated classes and not really useful and readable. And on the other side, we're writing more and more and more tests to getting stable. If someone changed something, um, nothing gets breaking up. And on the other side, um, a new feature possibility is like if some someone pull, um, creates a pull request with some changes for permissions or teams uh, and it fails the uh, build pipeline, they're getting feedback directly in the PR um, with why is that file and why isn't this not accepted because currently every exception is only printed in a log and the developer needs to searching out why is that happened and have no information about it. That's currently... What I'm doing the APU, that means I am improving the maintainability and try to reach a clean code status on the end. Now to my question part. Hopefully you now understand what to do with the APU and uh, what my part is on it. Thanks, Philip. Are there any questions for Philip? I can't see any for the time being. Okay, we'll give it another uh, minute or so. Yeah. We're doing good on time. Yep. Um, I think, so you can stop sharing, Philip, while we wait for questions and we'll let Dan Yang set up. No questions so far. So, Danyang, you may start sharing your screen, maybe. Oh, yeah, I see that. That's Mohammed. Can I type in the Q and A uh, section, Mohammed? Oh, okay. Hi, mom. <laughs> mom. I think we're good to go. All right. Stage is yours, Danye. Yes. So. Am I starting now? Yes, you can start yeah. now. Okay. So, hi everyone, and uh, my name is Danyang, and uh, I'm delighted to be here to share um, for the midterm review and share the progress of my project, the Manage Jenkins GitHub Permissions Code. I'm guided by my mentor, Alex, and who is a member of the Jenkins hosting team. So, let's begin. 
And uh, I'd like to share a little bit about myself. I recently graduated from the master's degree in the University of the Queensland. And uh, during my study, Java is my main, main program uh, language. And, uh, and the participating in the Google Summer of Code has been the incredible opportunity for me to apply this skill set in a real world setting especially within an open source community like Jenkins. So this project is fitting to me because it's allowed me to put into practice concepts that I learned in school but haven't yet to have a chance to use. So as a new um, newcom newcomer to a new open source project, I'm excited and, and uh, grateful that I can be chosen to be part of the community. So let's explore the background of the project. So what's the problem of the RPU? Maybe the one of the problem is that RPU is designed to manage permissions for over 2,600 repos in the organization. But this, despite its name, the current RPU don't, uh, doesn't have the function that could update or manage GitHub permission of the GitHub team or the team member. So it's basically to need to do manually and uh, operated by the hosting team. So as we can see in the screenshot, the every time a member submits a pull request, there are numerous checks and the confirmation to in place to, uh, to ensure the currency and the security. But, but despite this list, the final steps Step of to merging the pull request into to the menu integration and uh, to need to manually add or update the GitHub members. So why do we need to solve this question? Uh, this problem this may be really simple um, manner one because uh, overall the about the 3,000 history per request, there are about 2,500 um, PRs involved related to the developer teams. So these high values of the developer update currently require the manual management. It's consuming resource and it's made increasing the likelihood of the errors. So, my project is about to improve the RPU to be better handle the, the GitHub teams and the user directly. So first we we will plan to uh, using the RPU uh, to have a function to automatically to update the GitHub team and the user management. Also, we need to um um we need to regularly to check the YAML file and update the GitHub data to make sure any previous change and the team member that correctly update through the GitHub actions. So as a result, our main goal is to turn to RPU into a user-friendly system that handles frequently GitHub team and the user membership that you don't have need to so much the many help. So uh, in working on this, I have the several challenging, for example, so I need to test in new features without access since I couldn't test change directly in the real system for safety reasons. So I set up a similar test environment. So this lets me try out some new feature easily. Also, it's about the integration because I think new features that maybe cause the anxiety the effect, especially on the, for the other parts. So, uh, I I put this into the separate the files and uh, and that maybe could could release that this possible happen, and also that and. Um, the uh, we uh, we face the 
risk of the, like, that we when we look the past, this could be to change change the past and the information. So, so I make sure the paths are fixed and cannot be altered. So that is my um, major milestones. And uh, from now on, I have ready the pull request, the submission, and the, as uh, as we can see, and the, we can search it in the the RPU pull request in the three thousand and nineteen hundred and ninety eight. And now I'm ready to make the annual judgment, and also I will. Uh, uh, waiting for some feedback that may be from the technical or the business aspect that can be improved. And after that, we um, are waiting the final merge and deployment. And, uh, and within the period, I will do the maintenance and updates if necessary. So what about the future plan? So uh, uh, my mainly focus on the two main areas to improvement. For one is enhancing the program itself and the other is to make it out for you more user-friendly. So uh, first I, I aim to minimize the need of the manual handling. It's not, no, not only about our, our main goal, it's about the, to try to uh, make my um, my project to can be to self self explaining. It could be easily used and uh, and uh, could be handled more errors. Uh, also for the RPU enhancement that um, based on the um, most of the um, user could not use their system by reading the every single word of the uh, the guidelines. So. Uh, for RPU, it should be too easy to use and uh, no need to read for a long document. So that's the question part. Thanks, Danyang. Any questions for Danyang's project? No questions so far. We had a question from Hamid in the meantime, but I don't know if it's about the RPU project in itself or the RPU project part from Philip. And Mohammed, if you could please uh, elaborate a bit because the question was not that clear. So um, a few of us were not able to enter it directly. So please take some time if you'd like to. And yeah, okay, it, Mohammed said yes. So uh, we'll have another slot for answering to answer a question later on. So please uh, elaborate a little bit on your question and we'll try to answer it live afterwards. No new question, Alisa. Hi, Mark. Mark just joined. Okay, Sridhar, um, we will let you set up. Yeah. And whenever you're ready, you can start. Yeah, everyone can see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I will just tap now. So hello, everybody. And I hope that all you're just doing good. And thanks for coming and showing up here. I'm Shriya Shivakumar, and I'm just currently a GSOC mentor, working under the project using open data recipes for plugin monetization. And my mentors are Valentine, Bruno, Rajiv, and Bavianto. Wait a minute. So a little bit more about me. So I'm an academic student from India and I started my open source journey with Jenkins at the end of number 2023. And my interest lies on DevOps, low-level programming, and sometimes competitive programming too. So other than computer stuff, you can find me playing chess. So yeah, these are the following things that we'll be discussing in the upcoming slides. So the existing scenario in the Jenkins ecosystem and what are the concerns that are right now in the Jenkins ecosystem and followed by the project description and how it resolves the existing concern in the scenario. Following up with the progress that we made till now in the past six weeks. And then we'll just show a live demo up there. And we have 
uh, future plans are made up there. We'll just show the slides ending with the question session. Okay, in the existing scenario, the Jenkins system has nearly 2,000 plugins. It is a way more, and it's quite hard to maintain each and every one. And a great thanks to each and every mentors for maintaining each and every plugin. And in which nearly one third of the plugins are highly outdated. Highly outdated in the sense, since many of the plugins are still using Java 8. Currently, Jenkins is supporting Java 17, and they're just trying to get rid of Java 11. But still, there are many plugins still using Java 8. Similarly, it's not only used for highly outdated plugins, but it's also used for the code improvements and migrations. Migrations in sense, for example, there are some plugins that are just currently using JUnit 4, but in future, they are just trying to upgrade to JUnit 5. So these kinds of migrations are, are right now manual, right? So you should have to do it in an automated way. So that's what our tool does. Also, there's an interesting uh, tutorial by Mark and Darren, so who was just spend a time in a tutorial namely improve at plugin so which might also helpful and guide in improving the plugin about the project yeah as we said so project primarily aims to automate the modernization of plugins but how how we are just going to modernize those data and plugins so primarily the main the main motto up here is we are just consuming and leveraging the power of open debate recipes so to to clarify what is the open right? So open it is an automation refactoring ecosystem, which is used in our tool. So with the help of recipes, we are just recipes is a kind of a refactoring operations, which are applied to the plugins to modernize the tool. Yeah. So what are the functions that the tool can done? So primarily it just clones the plugin from the remote repository and applies the transformation using the open rate recipe. After application, it just validates the changes. If the validation passes, then it commits the changes and creates payout in the respective remote repositories. To learn more about the project, you can just go and visit the project page. And to learn more about the recipes, you can go and check out the recipe catalog in the open web page. Yeah. So the progress that we made till now, that is the progress that we made in the past six weeks. So right now, I just built a CLM module which passes the command line arguments. Command line arguments in sense. So it just passes the, the plugin name the recipe names, and also there are some other optional uh, op options that are available in our tool that we just that we that we will just discuss later in our uh, demo session. Also, we have just built a recipe which is exclusively which exclusively just extracts the plugin metadata. So these metadata can be used in an external file system, so external uh, repositories and metric systems like plugin health scoring. Also, we also we also build a core module which primarily applies the recipes to the plugins. So Right now, we can just apply and transform and modernize the plugin in our local computer, but not in the remote one. That's what we've just in the past six weeks. Yeah, let's go for a demonstration. Uh, everyone can see my get port screen, right? Nope. No, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so yep. much yeah, better. Thank you. So yeah, so right now, as I said, that uh, we don't have a direct direct link with GitHub, so you should have to manually populate the plugins up here. So just uh, clone a uh, two plugins up in inside this test plugin directory. So to see much more uh, a bigger description of the setup, you can just go through this readme file to know more about it. So, but to simplify, I've just set it up these two plugins in my local environment inside this test plugins directory. So, and everyone should have some kinds of tool. What are the options available in our tool? So these are the list of options that are currently available in our tool. So you can just list that. So you can just map the plugin names using the P option, and you can just map the recipe names using the OR option. And to display the list of available recipes, you can just use the L option. Let's go and try this out. So initially, I'm just using this L option to list the available recipes. So right now we just added these three recipes to test, to test the viability of the tool. In the future releases, we might add more number of recipes to this tool. Right, let's get into the game. Uh, okay, let's. I'm trying to apply two more recipes to these two plugins. So those recipe names are add plugin moms and add code owner. So we can just also see the, a little bit description about what the recipe does. So the add code owner recipe adds a, dot, a code owner file to this each plugin. So right now we can just see 
there is no code on files in this batch plugin as well as in the build timestamp plugin. So what this recipe does up here is it just create a code on file in both of these plugins. Also, I'm just going to add another another more recipe, which is add plugins bomb. What it does up here is it uh, Jenkins ecosystem is has a, a custom bomb, namely Jenkins plugin bomb. So as you can just see in this bomb file, that is a dependency management, and there's a group where it's Jenkins bomb. So this bomb is been used to maintain the versions of this dependencies. So when this bomb is enabled, you should it, it, it is it is not necessary to mention the versions up here. So this is quite redundant, right? So this recipe also adds this dependency if it is not present. And if there is a recipe present up, so there's a version present up here, then it will just get the redundant version up there. Because this is maintained by this dependency bomb. Okay, let's get into the action. So to so to mention the plugin, I'm just using the P option and the plugin names are batch plugin and build timestamp plugin. So I'm just mentioning those two names up here. And to mention the recipe names, we're just using the or option and the recipes and the recipes that you're just going to apply or add code on or and add plugins bomb. So these two are the recipe names. So as you can just see up here, and yeah, you can just click and handle. What it does up here is it will just initially run the clean phase, which which is not necessary, but it will be get ready in the upcoming releases, and just start right and just start the invoking waiting phase. Okay. In the meantime, I'll just try to show the feature plans up here. Oh wait a minute. I think. Okay. Let me wait for a few more minutes to to get complete this one. And also we can just see the log files in a new directory. So for each and every plugin, for the batch plugin and this build timestamp plugin up here. Yeah, so now we can see there's a, a completion of this related plugin stage for the batch plugin. So now we can just go and visit the GitHub directory, dot GitHub directory, and there's a presence of code on file. Yeah, so we have just successfully created a code on file for this batch plugin. Also, we just need to check this secondary uh, recipe, which is it just got written of this version, which is earlier mentioned as seven point something like that. So we just got the written as this version. So these two plugins are successfully applied to this batch plugin as well as the build timestamp plugin. So now we can just go and search for this build timestamp plugin, and also we can just find the code on the file up here. Yeah, that's what this tool does. Let's go back to my presentation. Okay, so I think that the demo is quite good, but uh, I'll just show my feature plans. Right now, those cloning process is manual, right? So we just need to automate those cloning, those cloning process in the upcoming releases. Also, we should have to automate the creation of pull requests in the respective repos. And also, we're just trying to prepare a common file to store the plugin metadata. So these plugin metadata are not only used in our files, but also in other repositories like plugin health score system, and uh, like to improve the plugin health score of plugins. At last, so last not, uh, we are also integrating more recipes in the upcoming releases. And at last, we're just integrating this system with this plugin health score system. Uh, for example, uh, suppose there's a probe called SEM probe, which just fails in some plugins. We can just click a button so which resolves those, uh, those probe failure in at one click. Yeah, that's about it. So let's go, let's move on to this question session. If any, I can't see any question for the time being. Are you okay if, if I raise questions that I didn't put in yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the facility? Okay, so thanks, Sridhar, very much. So the, the open rewrite step that you did uh, actually removed the required, the, the, the explicit version number very nicely. So it somehow is smart enough to realize that that explicit version number is maintained in the plugin palm because certainly not all dependency version numbers are maintained yeah. in the plugin palm. So it it has that intelligence already encapsulated in the open rewrite rule, and you're just using that, or did you have to do something to get that level of intelligence? Yeah, I think already they are just using this kind of intelligence, which is developed by Steve Hill in Open Rewrite Jenkins Rewrite Recipes. So we're just uh, running those recipes up here. We have not built any kind of recipe by ourselves except this 
fish metadata recipe. Remaining old plugins are just extracting those from this open rate platform. So they've Great. already okay. developed that. So the the so I could actually invoke that re recipe myself even. Yeah. It's not that I have to have your tool to do it. Your tool yeah. gives me a convenient way to enumerate. I'd like to run against all this set of plugins and do this thing. Great. Thank you. We have a question from Diraj. How do you aim to run this CLI tool in the future? Would you be running some recipes periodically on all the Jenkins plugins by a crown job? Uh, yeah, so we might also integrate as a, in the GitHub action in the future uh, releases, which might also uh, update automatically based on the outdated plugin uh, metadata. Yeah, so basically based on this metadata, we're just going to uh, class classify the plugins as the which are more which are more nice and which are not, and we're just going to apply recipes for all the recipes which are not more nice. So, and I've got another question if you're okay with one yeah. more, Bruno. Of course, go ahead. Thank you. So, so Open Rewrite offers one technique of inserting the Open Rewrite definition into the plugin source code itself, into the plugin's own POM file. But it looks like you did not choose to do that. Was there a, a reason why? I know why I've chosen not to do it. I don't want to clutter my POM file with rewrites that I've completed. Is there a reason why you chose, are there additional reasons why you chose not to inject yeah. open rewrite definitions into the into the plugin's own POM file? Yeah, so to be clear, so using the open rate, uh, the open source tool of the open rate thing, not the modern, modern one. So we can just uh, run the recipe on a single plugin once. So we can't, we can't just run the plugins on, so we can't just simultaneously run on multiple plugins. While this tool allows us to run the recipes on multiple plugins once, also as you said, it doesn't populate or it does, it does not contain this form file too. So these two are the reasons that I would just say. So I is there that. is there a possible consideration to, or I haven't, okay, now I'm really thinking far outside the box. Okay. What if we were to add the open rewrite rule definitions into the parent palm of all the plugins so that when a user updates to a new parent palm, they get an open rewrite definition. I, I hadn't evaluated that. I'm going to assume you probably haven't evaluated it either and that's perfectly okay. I was just curious if you had evaluated that. Not right now, I will just try it after the meeting, so. Oh, okay, and I, I, I don't know what that would even mean. So I'm, I'm not nearly Maven expert enough to say, oh, this would mean this thing. Thank you. That's it. That's all the questions I had. Thanks very much, Sridhar. And thanks, uh, Valentin. <laughs> no problem. If I may add, uh, add that, uh, an answer for that, uh, if that could be a good solution, but you would not be able to modernize and update uh, a plugin still relying on a very old version of the, of the parent. So this solution allow to basically update and modernize any plugin because it doesn't require anything extra on the pump file. That's so a very I hope good it point. Your question. <laughs> it, it does. That's a very good point. And I had not considered that. Thanks very much for that observation. It's this this tool has the benefit that whatever state that plugin is in, it can attempt to perform the upgrade without modifying the without doing more than the rewrite based modifications of the POM file. That's a yeah. good point. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Uh, we'll have to end up with these uh, questions uh, and switch to Noor's presentation. Alisa, right? Uh, it's okay with you? Yes. Yeah. Noor, are perfect. you ready? Thanks a lot for the question, by the way. That was really interesting. But maybe we should set up a meeting uh, one of these days about <laughs> this project. Noor, are you yes, there? I believe I'm ready. Uh, let me also know if you can share my screen, uh, if you can see my screen now. No, no, we could see it, but uh, oh, okay. we um, saw it, we saw it briefly and then it went away. Okay, uh, let me try again.
Yep, we no, we couldn't see it. Can you let me know uh, what you can see now? Yep. The slides or the present presenter view? Uh, the, pre uh, the slides with the um, um, notes. Notes. Which... With the notes, right? Yes. Yep. Okay, let me share the specific window. Um, yes. I believe I can share a specific window. So can can someone share the slides for me and maybe I can share at the demo time? Really uh, okay. Yeah, let me do that. Does it work? Let me see. Okay, so oh. yeah, that one. And slideshow. Yeah, uh yeah, thanks, Alisa. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, hi everyone. Um, Noor, I'm the mentee of um, enhancing existing LLM with domain specific Jenkins knowledge. Uh, we named our chatbot Gen AI. And this project is mentored by Chris, Harsh, Shibai, and Bruno. This is the agenda. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself and we are sharing why this project and what are the outcomes. Where are we at this stage and what are the upcoming steps, the demo time and the challenges we are facing so far, also the future work we have. Next slide. Okay. So about me, I'm Noor Mulham, a computer engineering student at Cairo University. Uh, I am a software engineer and interested in front-end development. And I've been working on machine learning projects for about two years now. And I'm enthusiastic to dive more into this field uh, this is my first time at Google Summer of Code, and uh, at the very beginning, I thought my expertise won't make it a Jenkins, but I found this project exactly matched my interests and started getting involved with this. And uh, this is my contact info, so you can reach out to me anytime. Next slide. Okay, so what is Gen AI? Gen AI is a pioneering chatbot that is trained specifically to answer users' queries about Jenkins technology, which enhance the accessibility and usability of software. We aim to provide faster and kind of reliable assistance to all our users. The model is integrated with a friendly UI to ensure better experience. So about the project outcomes, the project outcomes are collected data sets from different sources like Jenkins blog, community questions, and external sources. Pre-processing this data set to make use of it in training our model and fine-tuning Llama 2 on this data and provide an open source model to be used anywhere. Creating a user-friendly UI with a small server to, inter to interact with the model and eventually provide the documentation of all the effort done and a user guide to use our chatbot locally on your machine. Next slide. So what is interesting about Gen AI? Why would we choose this problem to work on? At this time, Jenkins don't have any AI-driven assistive technology to help Jenkins user answering their questions. We aim at this project that we combine Jenkins knowledge with AI to assist all users with the knowledge that usually a Jenkins expert has. So also we empower users to interact with this knowledge through a smooth user interface. So yeah, instead of looking for your answers here and there in many places, we may provide you a small system that run locally on your machine and answer your questions. Next slide. Okay. So where are we? of this long, interesting journey. This project involved many stages. Stage one is about data collection um, and this part from different uh, sources, just like Jenkins documentation and blogs. 
This course community questions and many external sources like Stack Overflow, Ask Ubuntu, and Stack Exchange. Stage two was about data pre-processing and refinement. We had three parts here. The first one is utilizing Jenkins documentation and blogs to generate uh, questions and answers out of this knowledge. So at this stage, we used another LLM to help us generating those pairs of questions and answers. And the second one here is using Stack Exchange queries to get a data set of questions with the correct solutions as on Stack of, of, Overflow and many other platforms. The data set generated included uh, many HTML tags like biograph codes and many unuseful blocks um, or maybe URLs. So furthermore, pre-processing were done at this stage to remove all unuseful information. The last part of this is utilizing the community questions where we could use discourse APIs to retrieve uh, posts asked and their reliable answers. Uh, all those parts are automated and the data set is provided on our repository. And doing so, we managed to collect around 4,100 pairs of questions with their reliable answers. Stages three and four are about creating a software with friendly UI to interact with our model. We use React, TypeScript, and Material UI components to help us creating this interface and used Flask to create a small server with only one endpoint so far to interact with this model. And stage five is actually the core of our project. Uh, we already started this before creating the software, but the effort of fine tuning is iterative and resumed until we make sure of the performance of our model. Uh, also, a lot of research is conducted at this stage to ensure we are choosing the optimal parameters and we obtain an accurate results. Stage six was about model evaluation. So so we don't rely on um, only uh, metric-based evaluation. We do, we do need both human-based evaluation and also metric-based evaluation. So at this stage, we use Druge and Blue metrics as our evaluation metrics. And the second to last stage is quantizing the model using Lama CPV to load the model and communicate with it using only CPUs to run on our local machine. And the last stage was um, about a trial of fine tuning Lama 3 before wrapping up everything. So we can easily see that um, where we are standing now, we are currently working on the fine tuning again and iterating over this process until we make sure of uh, the uh, relevance of our, our model. And basically this is our journey. This slide. So let's move to the demo time. Let me share my screen. I'm sharing the entire screen now. So let me know what you can see. I see your slides. Uh, yes, your your demo. Your okay. chatbot, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is Gen AI. Here we can learn more about the project, its outcomes and the mentors and all that stuff. And we can go to try it out. So we can ask him. Uh, the model now is um, not trained. We are currently working or iterating on the training of the model. So we are not expecting a big and more accurate answers right now. We are just showing them of our chatbot and our UI of this. So yeah, this is the chatbot. Here we can personalize uh, a little bit the response. So we can tell them that you are um, a helpful chatbot or be brief or anything else. Uh, let me go back to the slides. You want me to start sharing the slides? Yep. Okay, so yeah, the challenges we are facing so far, like, um, any other AI projects, the fine tuning of large language model often require high processing powers and GPUs were required in our case. So for the fine tuning procedure, we are using Google Colab as it provides us with 
G4 GPU with uh, 16 gigabyte VRAM. Another challenge was the optimization. So as uh, 16 gigabyte VRAM actually is barely enough to store the Llama 2 weights. So we needed an approach to load and efficiently train the, uh, the weights of the model. And that's why we are using uh, QLORA in our training procedure to load the model in four bit precision and optimize the VRAM usage. A final challenge was interacting with the model locally to ensure that our project achieved its objective. So we needed everyone to interact with the model on their local machine. We don't have, we don't require people to use Google Colab or something as a working environment to run the server and make use of the GPUs provided. No, we actually need to run it on our CPUs. So that's why we are using uh, Llama CVV to convert the model to its binary format. So anyone can load it and uh, interact with the model or communicate with it locally. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, this idea can be further enhanced uh, and many approaches are provided to achieve the same goal. First one is using retrieval augmented generation that combine the strengths of um, database or tradi any traditional information system with the capabilities provided in large language models. And finally, the usage of Llama 3 as Llama 3 has been trained on over 15 million tokens trillion tokens with data, z data set that is larger seven times than the one provided uh, in training Llama 2, which actually can make it outperform Llama 2 and fine tuning on Jenkins knowledge. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you for listening. And if you have any question, happy to help. So Noor, you said that the training had not yet had not yet completed. So in your demo, what is Jenkins? I think could have been answered from www.jenkins.io. Um, you did mention other data sources like community.jenkins.io. Have you been able have you been able to extract data from those kind of sources, or are they closed down so that you really can't get the data out of them? And how do you envision that training process working? Okay, uh, for extracting the data, actually community.jenkins.io provide uh, some APIs. The Discord provides some open source APIs to be used uh, with the same uh, Jenkins in the URI, URI. So we are making requests to uh, get all the posts uh, provided in uh, about Jenkins. And we are getting the, the post with accepted answers. Like there, there are many posts or maybe many questions that don't have um, recently any answers yet. So we are extracting only the one with the solution provided and we are getting the post and the solution in our data set. Uh, about Stack Overflow, also Stack Exchange provides um, yeah, some uh, databases that have uh, mostly most of the questions asked on Stack Overflow. Uh, and can be accessed and um, uh, get through some queries. Uh, we can set the threshold of example, the score of the question we uh, we are looking for or uh, questions with specific tags. So uh, using some queries, SQL queries, we can extract th this data of Stack Overflow, for example. So this is about the data collection. And and stack so community.jenkins.io I'm more comfortable with who who has rights to that I was less comfortable about Stack Overflow so are there legal or other risks associated with extracting data from Stack Overflow or are they okay with this as an experiment any any concerns on the legal or copyright trademark side uh, we are currently doing some experiments but I'm not sure about. Um... The, the legal side of it. Um, okay. I maybe, yeah, maybe I can search more about that. But I, I believe it's provided for open source usage through Stack Exchange. So I believe everyone can access it, this data. 
Um, so yeah, this is, does this answer your question? It does, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we're at time. And um, so if there's any additional questions, please feel free to post them on uh, our Gitter channels or discourse. So I'm gonna close it out. Thanks, Nora, for your presentation. And thanks to all of our GSOC contributors. So I'm gonna close it out by saying that um, we are always looking for mentors. So if you're interested in being a future mentor, please reach out to us again via Discourse or the Gitter channel. But otherwise, Jenkins.io has a ton of GSOC content and our YouTube channel has lots of recordings as well. So um, feel free to check those out. And But in the meantime, thanks again, everybody, for your time. Have a great one. Thank you. Everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.